That's awesome. Again, God bless you. If you're here watching and you're watching us online, I hope you're enjoying the service. I hope you are blessed. Church, how's everybody doing in the room today? Everybody doing okay? Everybody feeling good today? Amen. Amen. It's been a good time in the house of the Lord. Uh, Pastor Carlos, give me that bottle. Yeah, put it right there. On the, put it on the floor for me. Thank you. Pastor Carlos brought an awesome word. I, 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 uh, if you know Spanish, go on the Spanish, uh, the Hope Center Spanish website, get a hold of that. Tonight I want to talk to you about a topic. I hope it's going to make sense to you, make sense in my brain, but sometimes my brain is a little weird, so don't forgive me if it's all over the place. But the title of my message is called The Trophy Room. The Trophy Room. Um, amen. Y'all with me? Everybody good? Good. Um, in my brain, I, I, I was thinking um, some time ago that about trophies, about this thing, this, 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 this thing that they give out, and I was thinking about what trophies mean and how, what, they may, what they mean to us here on earth. And I don't know about you, but how many of you are sports fans? Raise your hand. Are you sports fans in this room? Amen. We have a team in New York that has a lot of trophies. You know the name of that team? The New York Yankees. Don't you say the Knicks. Don't you say the Knicks. We've been waiting for the Knicks. But we have a team in New York called the New York Yankees. The New York Yankees have 27 World Championships, 27 trophies. And I don't know about you, but I can imagine walking into their trophy room. Could you imagine walking into that? They got trophies going back to the 1920s. I mean, they got trophies all over the place. It's, a, it's amazing. And, and, and as I was thinking about trophies, I was thinking about, man, there are some trophies that are, are in, that, in that trophy room for the Yankees that are more valuable than others. How many of you know some trophies are more valuable than others? When we're kids or whatever, we get little trophies. Ever had those little trophies that they give out, even if you're on the team, and if you stink, they give you that little trophy? Or even, you know, they just give everybody that little plastic medal or whatever. They give everybody a, a, a trophy. But here it is. You know, those trophies, you know, they may, may mean something to us when we're young. But, but I can't help but to think, like, when you walk around the Yankee trophy room, you're like, wow, this is, this is amazing. This is an amazing spot. Uh, um, you know, there is no uh, franchise like the Yankees. You know, in, in New York, we have other teams. Like, we have, oh, Pastor Carlos left. That's, you see, he's slick. He knew I was going to talk about the Mets. How many trophies do the Mets have? Who said one? How dare you? We have two. See, they're trying to jip us, you know what I mean? It's, that's foul. Um, so, yeah, the Mets have two. The New York Giants have four. The Rangers have four. The Islanders have four. The Devils have three. Even uh, my man Dan likes the NYCFC. Y'all like soccer? That's what I thought. No, y'all don't. Don't for a Dan. That's just you. You like them. And they just won. They just won one. He walked in with a cup one time. Like, at the, the, like the day after they won, he walked in with a mug, told me he a fan for them forever. I was like, I never heard you talk about soccer. You know what I mean? But, but again, there are some trophies that are more valuable than others. And I was looking up this concept of trophies, and, and I found out that trophies have a long, long history. Trophies used to mark victories in, in former times. They weren't things made of metal. They were, they, they were, they were, uh, they were actually the, 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 the French use it as, a, as a, a symbol of war. When you had a great victory, you took a, a trophy off the field. The ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, they would actually build massive columns as trophies to signify, hey, we had a victory in this area. We had a victory in this area. And they would inscribe them, uh, inscribe things on these, these massive pillars about their victories, how what God did here, I mean, what the nation did here, what the nation did here. And so for many, many thousands of years, there have many different forms of trophies. And, and, and it's a, a trophy is a tangible, doable reminder of an achievement. It's, it, it serves as recognition for for something great that had been done. In our time, we look at trophies like it's a small thing, but, but, but if you look at the in annals of history, trophies are a big deal. And if you go to some of the, some of the ancient ruins in, in Rome, you will still find massive inscriptions about victories here and here and here. It's a marking. It's something that made a lot of, uh, it was very important for the history of a, of a person, a, a history of a nation. And I can't help but think to myself, and I, this may be foolish, but my brain, forgive me, give me some pastoral liberties. I couldn't help but think, I wonder if God has a trophy room too. I wonder if God looks at certain people or certain things, certain events, and he holds them in special regard. He has high recognition. There are certain things that happen. There are certain people that he looks at and he says, now that's a person of importance. That's an individual. They stand out. 
They've had many battles and many war, but they were victorious. That's a, that individual, and I, I couldn't help but think to myself, I wonder if God has a trophy room. He has a, a place where he, 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 he has things inscribed about, you know, and I think about certain people. If you remember the book of Job, the Bible says that Satan comes to the Lord, they're talking, and they bring up this man, Job. And the Bible says that the devil's like, yeah, I want to tempt somebody. And the Lord says, God says, have you considered my guy? There's my man, Job. And, you know, forgive me, that's in, the, that's in the third Samuel book of the Bible. I'm going to write that one day. So the Bible don't say that's my guy, but that's what my Bible says. That's my guy. Because that's what God was saying. Yeah, you've looked all around, but there's my guy. Uh, you know, the Bible talks about Moses in a certain light. You know, I don't know if you remember, there's a story where, where Aaron and Miriam start to talk about Moses. And God comes down and God starts, he, the Bible says he calls Moses, Miriam, and Aaron. I want to talk to you for a second. And what he says in, you know, 3 Samuel chapter 8, he says, how dare you talk about my man, Moses. That man is different. He's not like you. That's what he should have said. But he said, how dare you talk about my man. See, I think when God looked at Job, when God looked at Moses, he saw something different. He saw there's somebody that's willing to, to do what I ask him to do, to go where I ask him to go. I can't think that God looks at Abraham who makes him the father of the faith. I'm going to do so many things for you, Abraham. But I want you to go to a place I'm not even going to tell you. Let's be honest. If God told us that, we'd all be like, I need to pray on that again. But he said, no, Abraham, I'm calling you to. And what the Bible says is Abraham went the audacity. But I can't help but to think that in the trophy room of the Lord, there stands an inscription. There's my man Abraham who did what I asked him to do. These are the men who dared be who I asked them to be. And see, what, what, what gets me is the Bible says that there's a, something called the Lamb's Book of Life that's still being written. And I wonder in that Lamb Book of Life if there are still things being written down about us. I wonder if God looks down from heaven and says, hey, I, I want to inscribe. There are some people. The Bible says that in the book of Hebrews, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Have you ever read that scripture? When I read that scripture, I think of they're, 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 on, they're overlooking the, the gates of heaven, and I think they're looking at us. I think some of, some, some of those saints are, are cheering us on. Hey, don't, come on, come on, you got it. Some of, us are, some of them are looking and they're looking at our failures and they're rooting for us. They're pushing us. They're hoping. They're seeing and saying, God, that guy, that guy, that great cloud of witnesses. Again, that's just maybe my, it's my imagination as it moves. God even say things like, there, that man who failed me, David, is still a man after my own heart. And I can't help but to think that in heaven, maybe, you know, in, in us that come from the hood, there's some graffiti on the gates of heaven with an inscription, David, that was my guy. This is my guy, David. That's my guy. And I can't help but think that God is looking down in all of heaven looking to put some other people in that trophy room. Some people that I got to get in there. There are some people that belong in that place. Am I making sense this morning so far? I'm sorry if I'm using too much sports, but. And I want to talk about a, three thoughts in my mind. Three ways that we can make it into that trophy room. Three ways that we make sure, I don't want to say that we get noticed by God, but we can perk up the ears of heaven. We can perk up the, the ears in glory. I think of a team, and when I was growing up, my team was the New York Mets, church, don't judge me, Yankee fans. And I was 10 years old when the Mets went to the World Series, 1986. Oh, the glory, you remember that, right? You were young then, right? You remember that. Man, you were at the what? At the, see, she was there. She remembers, so right? I remember that team. That was my squad. I can name the squad to this day. I, that's my, my stepfather started taking me to Shea Stadium, I remember. But in the World Series, 
This is the truth. Don't judge me for what I'm about to tell you. I'm going to give you my deepest, darkest secrets. I was watching game six of the World Series with my mom, my stepdad, my cousin, and me. And the Mets are down by two runs. I think it was two runs. Maybe one run. It was one run. Bottom of the ninth, two outs. Mookie Wilson comes up to play. You know what I do? One strike. I said, okay. <laughs> two strikes. Now I'm 10 years old. Don't judge me. I turn off the TV. <laughs> it's over, Mom. I'm going to bed. They're not going to do it. And everybody's like, what you mean? I, I don't want to know what I was crying. I started crying. Don't judge me. I don't want to know what happens in the game now. They're going to know my voice is a little different then. I don't want to know. <laughs> and I went to my room, and I went to my bed, and I put my pet, head in that pillow, and I started to cry. But my cousin goes, we can't turn it off now. I was like, they're done. My team <laughs> cried. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> But she turns it on anyway. Now I'm in my room. I'm crying. And I hear roars come from the other room. I'm like, what happened? Mookie just hit it through this guy's legs. And I was like, what? It's impossible. I couldn't believe it. He legit won the game by an error. And the Mets won the 86 championship based on the fact that an error was made by a guy by the name of Bill Buckner. He is infamous for that error to this day. But here's one thing that, that, that's different about that trophy for the New, York, the, the New York Mets, the 86 Mets, and I'll put it against any trophy. That team had a never-say-die never attitude. They never quit. And when we look at that trophy, I mean, there's a trophy for a team that never gave up. They, I gave up. Their fans gave up. Have you ever been to a, go, a game where their team is losing and you just start to leave? <laughs> I've been there. I'm like, I want to beat the traffic. I got, I got to work tomorrow. And you leave, and you're like a scrub. And then the team comes back. You're like, what? What happened? That was me. But here's the Mets. They didn't give in. And I can't help but to think, and listen to me very closely, church, there are people in this church that need to get that attitude of, I can't give up now. It's not time to give in, church. I don't know about you, and I'm going to speak plainly to you, okay, because I love you. One of the biggest things that we're dealing with as a society is mental health issues right now. Mental health, that's a big deal. And, and we never dealt with them when we were kids. I don't know why. Like, we would just, I don't, we were, I don't want to say we were harder. I don't know if we just glossed over it. I don't know if we just kept moving. I'm not sure. But we, it's a different time now. There's a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. And there are a lot of people in our atmosphere who are ready to give up. Church, listen to me very closely. You and I are not called to give up. You and I are not called to give in. I know things are hard. I know things are difficult. I know that there's all kinds of stresses around us. I know that, that the world presents. I don't know about you, but I'm going to suggest to you that sometimes you got to turn off the nightly news. They throw so much negativity at you, right, that you can't help but, but get anxiety. I'm going to be honest. I can't front on this, okay? Watching the news, watching what's happening in our world, you, you get deep into that, you watch some YouTube video here about this thing and that thing, you can't help for the anxiety just well swell up in you. It just happens. I was watching this video, this shelter video about, about people who, uh, who make, uh, who make uh, like, uh, they, they make per, like shelters, like uh, bomb shelters. And they were saying, like, rich people are buying these bomb shelters that, like, legit, they're million-dollar bomb shelters. They're like houses on the ground. And I was watching this video, and I'm watching it, and I'm watching it. And as I'm watching it, I can feel the anxiety start to swell up in my spirit. Like, hey, but what about you? You don't have a million dollars? What are you going to And I can feel, I can feel the fear. See, the, some of the things that we're watching, some of the things that we're intaking, the devil is behind those things. There's a demonic agenda to get us to cower, yeah. to fall back into place, to, to let's go back into our comfort zone. Let's go back into do what we do. And I'm here to tell you, that's not of the Lord. Some of us, let, let me, again, I love you. Some of us intake more worldliness than the things of the Lord. We spend more time on YouTube and, and the news and this news thing and this news thing, and then we spend five minutes in the Word and there's no balance, and we wonder why we're, we're anxious. We need to switch that up a little bit, church. Come on. 
This is what the Bible says. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, like I read, like I said to you, since therefore we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let's run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking only to Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God, right? But said, for consider him who endured such hostility against against uh, bystanders, against himself, so that you and I will not grow weary and lose heart. He did, he endured some things. So church, we're going to have to endure some things too. Church, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Some of you have been waiting on some prayer. Some of you have been waiting for God to do some things in your life. Don't you give up right now. Isaiah 40 says like this, though young people grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait on the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Those who wait on the Lord. Some of y'all giving up too quickly. I was talking to a sister earlier. We were talking about certain things. And she looked at me and says, well, you're just going to have to get thicker skin. Huh. Huh. You know, let's, let, me, let me just tell you, if I had told my grandfather, hey, grandpa, I call him papa, papa, I'm having an issue right now. I'm struggling with, my, you know, I'm not trying to belittle anything. But I can't imagine going to my grandfather and saying, I can't get a job. I can't make money. He'll look at me and go, what? <laughs> like, you can't get a job. Because, you know, young people now, they're like, I can't work at McDonald's. I can't work. I can't work at Payless. Is there Payless still around? I don't even know. My bad. Sorry. <laughs> Dollar Tree. Forgive me. <laughs> but, you know, you got young people that come out of school. They're like, I want this job. That's going to pay me $84,000. They're going to give me the insurance that I want. They're going to give me, and you think, I'm sitting there going, who did? <laughs> Nobody told me that's how it was supposed to, because when I came out, they were like, yo, load this truck. Yep. <laughs> I'm like, load that. And they were like, with those big old boxes, you figure out how to get it from there to there. <laughs> Nowadays, they'd be like, but I need a hand truck. I need help. Huh. <laughs> and you ever, when you were young, you ever think about quitting? But you think, if I go home and tell them that I quit, they're going to be like, you did what? <laughs> quit. <laughs> My grandfather used to shovel coal for a living. Coal. You ever shovel, you ever shovel, shovel coal for a few hours and see what it does to your lungs? I've done it. It does something to you. But they did it. My grandfather went to World War II. You know the story he told me? I think I've shared it before. He told me that he left. He came back four years later. They didn't even know he was gone. That's what the generation was. You went to war. You came back. Get to work. Take care of your family. Let's rock. Nowadays, you get parades. Nowadays, and I'm not trying to belittle anything, but there was a generation that talked about thick skin. Have you ever, have you ever asked your, your mom for those of us, ask your mom and your dad how much they got paid and how they paid the rent. Sometimes I ask my mother, she would come home with a little check, and I think, you paid the rent with what? You did what? You put food on the table with that check? Back in the days, they never shut down school when it snowed. I'm jealous a little bit. I ain't gonna, I'm, I'm having a therapy session right now. Forgive me. I remember walking in the snow. was like him. I was like, no, you going to school because I'm going to work. You know, they shut down trains now. The buses don't run. What are you talking about? You know what I mean? They had, they had blackouts. People walking the bridge. I got to get to Brooklyn. You in the Manhattan on the Brook? I'll be there in a few hours. Don't you worry. Nowadays, it's like I got to find a hotel. I can't walk. I can't go. You got a hotel for me over here somewhere? I can't. <laughs> Can I stay at your house? You live. <laughs> walk home. See, thick skin. I think, you know what, we, 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 we follow in the, the, the culture, and the culture is all about my feelings, how I feel, how it makes me feel, my comfort. I'm a Christian, and it's warfare. 
And sometimes we have to have our boots strapped up real tight and know that every day is going to be a battle. Every day. And some of y'all, the people that got baptized, people that are in ministry, let me tell you, you think because I'm, oh, I'm in ministry now, God's going to be, God's going to honor me, bless. Yeah, God honors. But when you go in deep with Jesus, guess who sees? All of hell. And now, now they're like, oh, so you want to start working for Jesus. Oh, you want to start praying with power. Oh, you got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Oh, you want to do something. You want to talk to your neighbor about Jesus. You want to save your family. Well, you know what the devil does? Well, let's see how, how sensitive you are. And he'll throw some, some things in your way, and some Christians fold like a cheap tent. I'm a pastor. I love you. Don't come to this altar over and over and over and over and over and over for the same battle. Are you ever going to get victory or what? But see, it's not like, but pastor, and I get his heart. But sometimes you got to man up a little bit. And you got to be like, listen, I'm going to fight this fight. You know, I've been trying to teach the young kids that I know, yo, Jesus wasn't a punk. Yo, we got to, oh, he's soft and he's got the sheep. But he also, Bible says, he walked into the temple and he took a table when he was unhappy and said, I'm not happy with what's going on here. The Bible calls him the lion of the tribe. But the lion ain't no passive little animal. So I'm going to treat him like he's a domesticated dog. When my Jesus is raw, he's not happy with things. He's got things to say. Hmm. We want to sit here and take everything the culture has given us. I'm not sure. Now, Jesus would have loved people, but he would have corrected people too. And his life, and not for nothing, but his life would have outshined the sinfulness, right? He was walked out there and people were like, there's something different about this guy. If Jesus were a sensitive individual, about the first time the Pharisees, maybe the second or third time the Pharisees, and he knew because the Bible says he could he read their thoughts. He knew the intention of their heart. He knew they wanted to kill him. Jesus could have been like, you know what? I'm not built for this. Lord, Father, take me home. Doing Elijah. And that would have been okay. But he said, no, the Bible says he endured. He knew what was coming, yet he did it anyway. See, Jesus wasn't soft and passive. We need to, we need to do a study on Jesus because he was a carpenter. Have you ever met somebody that works with their hands? I knew a guy who was a mason. And even when he was 70, the man was solid as a rock, like boom. Boom. Working with stones all his life. He was strong. It's just what happens to the part of the work. Have you ever seen the, the hands of a man who works with, have you ever seen how rough they are? Jesus wasn't a soft dude. Being a carpenter back then with the tools they had, this dude had to be about his hand. He wasn't soft, sensitive. <laughs> Jesus wasn't about giving up. He had a purpose. He knew his purpose. He says, I got, I'm going to do what I'm going to do no matter what they say, no matter what they do, no matter what the devil says. Remember remember the devil coming to him, tempting him before his ministry? Even when he started ministry, the devil was after him. And what did, the devil say? What did Jesus say? Get. <laughs> you were not going to tempt the Lord your God. Step to the back. Somebody need to get it in your bones. Now, I'm not, I'm not here trying to get you to talk to the devil and all that, but when you have power, let me tell you something. You're not afraid of what he got. You're not afraid of his devices. You're not afraid of his schemes. What scheme? What the what? You know what? The, the Solomon writes, there's nothing new under the sun. All these schemes that we see, this stuff's been around for thousands of years. He may window dress it a little different, but the same scheme, the same attack, the same thing, the same, t- t- the same temptations, it's all, this, all it's common to man. When are we going to get into, into our spirit to be like, yo, we've seen this before. Devil, get out of my way. You can't give up. Christian, you can't give up. I'm going to challenge you. Turn off the news cycle if you can't handle it. Don't feel like you're a punk or you're weak. Be honest with yourself. My man, this anxiety's got me. This worry has got me. This depression has got me. Well, deal with it. Start reading the word. Fill your house with praise and worship. Stop watching things that are no good for you. PG-13, it's no good for you, grown people. 
Just in case you think, oh, I'm, I'm grown. No. That stuff is demonic. What? Guard your heart, the Bible says. From out of it is the wellspring of life. Guard your heart. You with me, church? Don't give up. Don't give up. I also want to tell you, there are people that are watching me right now. There's a brother that's watching me. He told me he watches every Sunday. He's home, and he's in bed, battling a sickness that they don't have an answer for. But the same way I'm telling you not to give up, I'm also going to tell you that the battle is not over. Some of you in this room may be battling some things. I had a conversation with a young lady yesterday who shared with me some things that, that uh, the Lord needs to move on. Sometimes, like I said, when we get weary, when we get, when we, when we get afflicted in a certain way, when the enemy comes back like a flood, we think, okay, this is the way my life is going to be. This is the way my life is going to turn out. This is just my lot in life. I'm here to tell you, no, it's not. I'm here to tell you that the battle is not over until the Lord says it's over. Amen. You don't get to say when it's over. Because some of us in our flesh want to be like, I put my hands up. I give up. You ever been there spiritually? I give up on this. I'm tired of fighting this particular. I'm going to move it on. And we leave that baggage there. The Lord's like, no, 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 no. That fight's not over until I say it's over. Some of you are battling some things in your flesh, in your sin. We all have things. I'm here to tell you, you are not here to make peace with your flesh. You are not here to make peace with that besetting sin. You know that sin that plagues you, plagues you, plagues you? I've been there. I'm a man. I get it. But let me tell you something. You're not here to play nice with that thing. You're, play, you're here to put that thing in its place on a consistent basis because it's not over. Hmm. I want to speak to my afflicted. If you're afflicted in body and spirit, hear me. The Bible says in Psalm 102, hear my prayer, Lord, and let my cry come for help to you. Do not hide your face from me on the, my day of distress. Incline your ear to me. On the day when I call, answer me quickly. For my days have ended in smoke. My bones are scorched like a heat. My heart has been stuck like grass and it is withered. Indeed, I have forgotten to eat my bread. Because of the loudness of my groaning, my bones, my bones cling to my flesh. Have you ever been there? Have you ever had this kind of moment? It says I, in verse 7, I have become like a solitary bird on a, on a house. My enemies have taunted me all the day long. They deride me. They use my name as a curse. They have eaten my, I have eaten my ashes like bread. I have mixed my drink with weeping. Have you ever been there? I've been there. I've been there. But verse says, verse 12 says, but you, O Lord, remain forever. But you, but you, Lord, arise and have compassion. The Bible says in verse 17, he has turned his attention to the prayer of the destitute and has not despised their prayer. Hallelujah. Watch this. Talk about a trophy. This will be written for the generation to come and that a people that have yet to be created will hear and praise his name. Hmm. Hmm. Can I say something to my people that are afflicted, my brother? The greater the pain the greater the victory. The greater the pain, the greater the affliction, the greater the hurt, the greater the body hurting, the greater your, the, the victory is going to be that much more greater. I'm telling you, one Tuesday, Sister Maida, during one of our prayer meetings, I'm going I'm to have a testimony service. Because some of y'all don't know what's happening even in this room. 
I bet you if I turned the microphone over, I could have a person come up here and say, let me tell you how the Lord healed me. I can tell you how the Lord freed me. I can tell you how one day I was in spiritual prison and the Lord set me free. Some of y'all need to hear that the Lord is still active, that the spirit of the God is still moving, that he is still healing, that he is still releasing from the demonic, that he is still bringing peace to the, to, to the mind, that he is, he is freeing those who are bound to change. The Lord is moving. Maybe we just haven't said it enough. Hmm. I long to see my brother who's at home get up here and worship again. I long to see the people that are here and can't do it say, I'm going to get up. I'm going to raise my hand. The, the devil don't have me. My flesh don't have me. My body don't have me. The, my victory just has yet to come. Huh. Come on, we need some testimonies up in this place. The Bible tells us that the woman had the issue of blood was bleeding 12 years. Pastor Carlos preached on this earlier, but all she could think of, just one touch from the master, it's over. Twelve years she suffered, but that woman did not give up. She did not give in. Could you imagine if she was soft? The Bible says that there was a crowd around Jesus, and they told her, don't do it. Don't bother the disciples. Get away, leave her. She's not worth it, but that woman's like, worth it. I'm touching him today. I'm getting a touch from the master today. I'm going to touch the hem of that man's garment. Those of you who are afflicted for some time, don't you dare give up. Your battle is not over. God's still in the midst of you. From, what does the Bible say? From beauty? No, from ashes. Beauty. But you know how you get ashes, right? Huh. See, problem is we don't, see, I remember I, I think I shared this. Mark Batterson had a book talking about miracles, and I remember reading in the very first chapter, it says, yeah, a lot of people want miracles, but people don't want to go to the place that needs a miracle. See, we talk a good game as Christians. Oh, yeah, I want a miracle. But sometimes the Lord has to take us through some things. And in that, and when we go through the things, the Lord's like, okay, maybe he just, again, I'm not trying to play God, but I can't help wonder if he's like, no, a little bit lower. There's more you need to go through, a little bit more. But then there's that moment he's like, it's time. It's time. And heaven comes. Boom. And in a moment's notice, everything changes. Church, I want to remind you that he, we read about him healing the leper. Those who were paralyzed. Those who were mute. Those who were blind. Those that were dead. One touch from the master. Changes everything. Am I making sense right now? I'm here to tell you that I believe that when the Lord looks down, he's looking for a people that are not going to give up, that are not going to give in, that are not going to stop moving forward, that are not going to stop worshiping in the midst of their hardship, that are not going to stop praising in the midst of the pain. Dare I even, even say that the greatest worship is the one that's done in the valley? I can't help but to think that when Jesus looks at us, he looks at us Sunday morning people that can kumbaya it up and sing and worship and dance. He's like, yeah, that's good. But he's looking at the one that's lowly, the one that's worshiping through the pain. And he goes, now that worship I hear. The fake stuff, and it's all good when you're happy. See, because everybody likes to worship when they're happy. Everybody likes to worship when the cupboard is full. Everybody likes to worship when all my bills are paid and everything's all good. But when you're going through it and you're in the middle of a battle and you can't see the way out, let me ask you, church, are you willing to worship then? Everybody, those of you that have been around for a while, everyone reads their Bible when the Lord's nice and being all, all nice father, but when he's whipping you, do you open the Bible then? Or you, do you say, I'll wait till we get over this, Lord? I would think that the Lord regards the one that still goes to his word even when he's in pain amen, amen. as the one that I'm going to speak to that one. Are you with me, church? Hmm. Hmm. I want to talk about one more trophy. You ready? Forgive me again. I root for some weird teams. Me and Elder Gloria. There's one trophy that's special in all of sports. It's true. A lot of people make fun of my team. But uh, 
our team, me, Elder Gloria, we, we suffer together. We suffer together. We root for the Jets, church. We root for the Jets. You, you a Jet fan? I got one, two. Oh, boom. Oh, 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 Lord is hearing my cry. <laughs> there's more of us, Elder, there's more of us. Oh, Lord. There's more of us. Hallelujah. See, I always tell people the reason why I root for the Jets is because it's the, I know it's the Lord's team because he keeps us humble. <laughs> I got nothing to brag about. For, for, I got nothing to brag about. <laughs> Foul. But the Jets have a trophy, just one, the 1969 Super Bowl trophy. And this, this trophy is special because this trophy transformed football. It transformed football. At that time, there were two leagues. There was the AFL and the NFL. And the NFL was really strong. They were powerful. They were the big dog. Then there was the little AFL, and the AFL started to lose, lose business, and they weren't so good. They were looked at as inferior. And so the NFL was going to, the AFL was starting to go out of business, and the, so the NFL said, you know what, to help you, we'll take a few of your teams, just to help you, and then the rest of the teams fold. We'll take a few. It took about, I think, six or so, maybe four. One of those teams was the New York Jets. And so the New York Jets were this team, they were this, this lowly team, and um, but lo and behold, they had a good season in 1969. And they, wound, they found themselves in the Super Bowl against the, one of the greatest teams of all time, the Johnny Unitas led, I believe Johnny Unitas led, Baltimore Colts. Johnny Unitas is a legendary figure in football. And when the odds came out and, and, and everybody looked at it, they were like, they're, this massive team, the Baltimore Colts, they are going to crush the, I mean, they are going to destroy. Like, it's, like everyone's like, there's no shot. Like, remember, like, they don't have a shot. But forgive me for being spiritual with the Jets, forgive me. But... <laughs> But then there was this young, cocky quarterback. His name was Joe Namath. And Joe Namath said, they asked him, so you're going to lose? And he goes, who said we're going to lose? Cocky. They were like, what? You, you know you're against, going against the Colts, right? He goes, I guarantee you we win. Everybody goes, what? Impossible. This AFL team can't go against this coat. It's impossible. But this underdog, this underdog stood there and he was like, I don't think you understand. See, see, he had confidence. Looking at the odds, looking at what was against him, he still stood there and said, No, we got this. See, and this is how they changed football because at that moment, the whole league realized anybody can do it. They're not scrubs, they are strong. Joe Namath is in the Hall of Fame just because of that one game. He wasn't any great, but because he said that, it's the greatest underdog story of all time. And so that trophy, that, that jet trophy has special lure that they were the underdog. Yet they looked at the odds and they said, no, I don't think you understand. We're going to win. I can't help but think, I was talking to my wife about this. She think, she's like, think about Joshua and Caleb. Bible says Moses sends them into the promised land and they come back and they go whatever and, and, and they come back to the God's people. The 12 spies. And they're like, uh, yeah, it's a great land. It's just like they promised us. It's flowing with milk and honey, Moses. You don't understand. It's great. It's great. It's great. But we have a problem. We are like grasshoppers in their sight is what the spy said. We can't do it. We can't do it. We can't do it. But here comes Joshua and Caleb. And it's not even Joshua. Caleb says, and, and again, in the book of 3 Samuel chapter 8, it would have gone like this. <laughs> Caleb gets here, I don't think you understand. Forget about these punks over here that say we can't do it. God told me, Moses, God told you that that land over, over there belongs to us. And his words are, it's ready for us. Don't you understand? See, I don't think you let, see, this is, the, this is the, the, the underdog award, the underdog trophy. Because the truth of the matter is, church, when I stand here in this pulpit right here, I stand here as an underdog. You stand there as an underdog. Because when all of hell presents itself to us, we don't have a chance. When all of hell comes to our door trying to fight with us, trying to hurt us, trying to discourage us, when they bring giants before us like they did David, I hate to tell you, church, as good as you think you are, in our flesh, in our simplicity, we don't have a shot. Right. We were born into sin, and the truth is, is we, have, we should be dying into sin. 
We're born with nothing. We're going to die. We're, 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 it's, but I thank God that there was one that said no. All of hell, I want you to understand the history of the things in the, in the scriptures. Do you know that at one time the devil had control? He was like, I got this. I'll destroy you, I'll kill you. Remember, he took even God's people into slavery. Oh, I'll enslave you. They will treat you like dogs. They will treat you like this. They will do this to you. Yet God said, that's my underdog. Those are my people. And I'm going to come. And I'm going to change the game. I promise you, we were underdogs in the sight of God, but yet when Jesus came, he came to this earth. He came to walk among us. And then he went and went with the Father. He said, I'm, it's better that I go away. I'm going to send something to you. And what I send to you is going to send the devil trembling. What I do in your life, what I do through you is going to send all of hell away. They're going to be more scared of you than you are scared of them. There's something I'm going to do. See, I don't know if in our imagination we can understand and we can fathom, but when Jesus went to a cross, we were all there in our sin, in our sinfulness, bound for hell, not being able to do it. We were against it. The devil had control. The devil thought he had control. The devil was winning, but there Jesus stood next to the underdog and said, hey, watch what I'm going to do for you. Watch what I'm going to turn. I'm going to turn this whole thing around to give you life. Watch how I'm going to turn this whole thing around to give you a life. You can't even understand. I have power for you. You can't even understand. So when hell comes against you, when your depression comes against you, when your anxiety comes against you, when all the problems come against you, you have authority to stay in there. Yeah, you are the underdog, but next to Jesus, you are the majority. Next to Jesus, you are the giant. Next to Jesus, you are the one with strength. Next to Jesus, you are the one with power, church. See, some of us still live our lives as the underdog, as the one that gets talked down to all the time. You're never going to win. You're never going to beat the devil. You're never going to beat this flesh. And I, 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 gotta, I hope, I wish the Lord would just shake some people and say, don't you understand the power that I've given you? Don't you understand that the devil is more afraid of you than you know? You don't understand the power in your prayer. You don't understand the power in your faith. The devil knows. The Bible says that demons tremble. And shudder at the name of Jesus. In this room, if you're going through it and you think that all the hell is against you and you're not going to make it, I'm here to tell you, it's time to stand up. You are not the underdog anymore. You are not the small kid on the block anymore. You are not the one that gets put in the corner on timeout because the devil wants to have his way. You need to reverse that. And in Jesus' name, say, devil, you get in the corner and I'm taking authority over all the stuff that's happening out here. Some of you in your families need to put the devil in the corner. He's running rampant trying to do some things, and you're playing the, the sucker role. Might I remind you, the Bible says you are the head and not the tail. You are the lead. You are in front. You are the one with dignity and power and strength. The devil put him in his place. Get behind me, Satan. Come on, church. We don't have time to play games now. Hmm. Come on. Fearless. Okay. Don't give up. The battle's not over. God's got you. You got it. <laughs> let me tell you another trophy. In our day and age, we give out something called the participation trophy. <laughs> yeah, I know those, right? The winners get big trophies, but not to make it to make everybody feel good, they give everybody little trophies. You ever seen that? <laughs> let me let me read to you how Paul says it. In first Corinthians chapter nine. So in verse twenty four. Do you not know that those who run the race all run? But only one receives the real prize. Run in such a way that you will when Christians, 
There is no such thing as participation trophies in the things of the Lord. There is no such thing as, hey, you'll get to heaven. You'll just squeak by. I'm a good Christian. I'll be good. This nonsense and that nonsense. Stop. You got to run your race in life, this this race of faith, to win. There is no pat you on the back. You're doing a good job all the way back here. Have you ever watched the New York City Marathon? A lot of people cross the finish line. But they mention one name on the news. The the person who won. Some people think, well, I'm running, and they're passing me, and I'm running, I'm at my own speed, and I'll make it, I'll just be okay. No, you have to run this race to win. Fight the good fight and win this race. Go all out for the things of the Lord. Don't do things halfway. Don't do things half measure. Don't do things lukewarm. Church, enough is enough. I don't know about you, but I've been observing that there's some stuff starting to shake out in our world. I don't want to get into the specifics of what's happening, but I don't know about you, but this is LGBT Pride Month, and the Lord's done a few little things that have kind of shifted. I'm, I, I don't know about you, but I, I'm actually, it's LGBT Month, and, and some things are starting to shake. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's like the Lord is saying, it's time. Like, we're going we're gonna to make a dash for this now. Like, we're going we're gonna to put things in place real quick. Now, the problem is, is that, you know what, the Lord starts putting things in place. Like, he sets up the marathon, and then it, some Christians are not going to want to run the race. I go, that's nice. No, he's like, no, it's time. Church, it's time. It's time to take this thing by the horns and win. The church has been playing the tail for too long. It's quiet in here. The church has been playing the tail for too long. The church has been playing the victim role. The church has been content in the shadows. The church has been content being maligned, marginalized talked about, made fun of. But maybe God's saying, hey, it's time to shake some things up. But you're going to have to run this race run this race, to win. That means you're going to have to grab your stuff, put on your sneakers, and run. Some of us are trying to speed walk. He said, run. Some of us are trying to, buy, I'll meet you there. No, no, no. Get your shoes on and run. Run the race. Win. Maybe the days are starting to turn around because the days are starting to get short. And maybe the Lord's coming back. And he's like, hey, run. Run. Am I making sense right now, church? The Bible says in verse 26, Paul writing, Therefore I run in in such a way not to run aimlessly, but I box in such a way to avoid hitting there. He's not shadow boxing, church. He's hitting something. But I strictly discipline my body and make it my slave so that as I have preached to others, I I myself may not be disqualified. Hmm. Paul saying, when Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 through 23, beware of false prophets who will come to you in sheep's clothing. Inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will mo- know them by their fruit. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good fruit can a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad fruit bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into to the fire, so then you will know them by their fruit. There is no, I came to church, I was a good little Christian. If you're not running the race, you lose. No participation. The Bible says, Jesus saying, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. A lot of Christians are holding up participation trophies thinking they're doing something for the Lord, saying, I don't even know you. <laughs> Run the race, church. In my last, my last trophy, 
It's called the sellout trophy. Pastor Carlos, if you know sports, let me tell you a little story. When I was growing up, there was a ball player by the name of Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds was one of the greatest ball players of all time when he was young. What happened was, uh, I think in like, um, maybe like 94, 95, two men started to hit a lot of home runs. They Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa. They started to hit a lot of home runs. And, uh, and they were hitting, and they were hitting him at a record pace. And here's this guy, Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds was great. Great. Like Hall of Fame. Great. Like no, like, anybody knows sports? No doubter. Like this guy was making. And these guys over here are hitting home runs like crazy. They're doing their thing. And this guy got jealous of those guys. He was like, how come they're getting all the publicity? How come they're getting all the press? How come everybody's focused on them? And look at me. Oh, he was great. I'm telling you, he was great. Everyone knew. So he got jealous of those guys. Right? And so what no one knew at the time was these guys were on steroids. They sold out. They were juicing. But they were hitting home runs like crazy. Then they found out they were juicing. But this guy was like, but I want to be like them. But they were cheating. But this guy was great. So you know what he said? I want to be like them. So this great individual started doing what they did. And he got even greater. But then people looked at them like, yo, we know they're cheating. Look at him. You know, if you know baseball, he, his body physically changed. Like, he was a skinny dude, like about 200 pounds. He became like a, like a 240, 250, rock-solid big guy. But people were like, we think he's cheating. And he fought it, and they were like, and these would come out in the news. And it breaks my heart to think that he was great. If he had just stopped and he said, okay, this is who I am, I'm good. I don't care about them. I'm better than them. But he got so fascinated. He got so clouded. He got so clouded with fame and what they had that he forfeited his greatness for the fake thing. Like legit. Now, those guys are not going to the Hall of Fame, but now they're saying about this guy, they're like, he's fake. But anybody that knows would say, but he was great. What did you do? You disqualified yourself because you wanted to be like them. Sad story. It's a sad story. You can look it up. I am not lying. And when, so when Paul says, I run in such a way not to run aimlessly. I box in such a way not to beat the air. I, do, I strictly discipline my body. That I make it my slave. So I... I myself am not disqualified. You see, I'm talking about this trophy room in heaven. I'm talking about God looking down on us. I can't help but think that God looks down with a broken heart. Because there are some people, you're in this room, you're watching, we're part of the body of Christ, and God's like, I have built greatness into you. Like it's in your DNA. See, the Lord does not... Create chumps. The Bible says, while you and your mother's womb, he created you marvelously and wonderfully made. That's who you are. You are amazing. Just how you, you have greatness. You have divinity. You have a special calling already engrafted in your DNA. God has a calling. But there are so many that are disqualifying themselves in the things of the Lord because they're so busy looking at the things of the world that they're like, I want that. I want that. I want that. But greatness is here. You're disqualifying yourself. You're, you're throwing your calling. You're throwing your, you know, all that God has for you. You're throwing it to dogs. The Lord looks down. Yes, David and Moses, Abraham, I have saints over here. We have it. We're ruining on. But I can't help but to think there's a group that's saying, what are you doing? Why are you throwing away your divine destiny? Why are you throwing away the call on your life? Why are you throwing away the things I have built? There are things I have for you to do here. Guys, let me be plain. Pastor Carlos and I could preach to a blue in the face. We can't reach everybody. There's a calling. There are people that need to be reached by people that are sitting right in these rows. There are evangelists in this room, and you're sitting on your calling. There are pastors in this room, prayer warriors that should be sitting with the prayer team, but we're sitting on our giftings because we want to be comfortable in the things of the world. And we're sacrificing. I'm telling you, this guy, Barry, 
Hall of Fame lock threw it away to be like two scrubs who were never going to amount. They were never bound for that. But he was blinded and wound up disqualifying himself. Church, we're at a time, and, 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 and uh, I keep saying this, you're going to have to choose what side you're going to be on. You can't come to church and be like, okay, yeah, I want God to do what I got to do. And on Sunday, you're here trying to be all holy or whatever. But then on Monday, you're like, yeah, but I'm going to chase that dream. I'm going to chase my ambitions, what I want, that job, that money. I want that relationship. I want this. I want that. I want that. And God's like, I did not call you to that. That's dog food. That's junk. Have you ever read the scriptures, I prepare a, a table, a feast for you, the Bible says. Revelation, I want, I want to sup with you. And you're over here eating junk food with the world, and I've prepared things here. And I can't help that cloud of witnesses is looking down saying, come on. Get a hold of yourself. Come on. You're called. God has his hand on you. Be who I've called you to be. Don't give in. Don't get discouraged. Don't throw in the towel. Come on. Josh, you can come. The sellout. The sellout award. That trophy is good for nothing. That participation trophy, just being church, just being a participant in a Sunday morning, I love you all. This does not equate you to being a Christian. This does not give you relationship with Jesus. This is, this is something we do. We meet, we come together, we fellowship. But your relationship with Jesus should not be dependent on Sunday morning church activity. Then let me talk to my, my ministry people. If your identity is a ministry, we've lost. I do what I do because I love him. I don't do what I do because I have to punch a clock. Sometimes ministry can become a crutch. Your ambitions, you, you want to do, 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 and be, just ha know him. Have a relationship with the Lord. Are you with me, church? I'll end with this. Revelation 21 says like this, verse 7 and 8. I love you, church. The one who over, will overcome, the one who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. The one who overcomes, he is saying, I will be his God. You will be my child. But for the cowardly, but for the unbelieving, but for the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, those the liars. Their part will not be with me, he says, but in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Did you hear me, church? To the one that's not, that doesn't give up, he says, I will be your God. To the one that is going to hold on, to the one that, that's going to keep fighting, I will be your God. To the one that, 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 that says, yes, I may, be, I may be facing a lot, but I'm going to hold on to Jesus. He says, yes, I will be your God. You will be my son. You will overcome. But to the one that does not, to the one that lets go, to the one that goes by the way of the world, to the one that, that, that sells out, to the way that, that is in lukewarm, right? One in the world, one hand in the church trying to play that game. He says, but the cowardly, the one who's not brave enough to be what I've called him to be, the one that's not taking hold of the Holy Spirit, the one that's, that's being a coward, you're being a chump, the one that does not believe me, the one that does not take me at my word. Can have no part with me. I don't know about you, but that scares me. Church. We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. They're looking at us. The Lord's looking at us. And I believe that there are some people in this room that the Lord's like, yes, you're going to overcome. I boast on you. I boast on you.
So don't give up. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Don't be shaken by the fight. Don't be shaken by the hardship. Don't be shaken by what happens to your body. Don't be shaken by what happens to your finances. Don't be shaken by what happens to the people around you. Stand strong. Now is not time to cower. Don't give up. That depression trying to bang you, those thoughts coming at you, Go back into the world. Be that was comfortable. Fight. Don't give up. Don't give in. If you're in this room and you feel like, Pastor, I'm trying, but it's hard. Don't give up. The Lord's closer to you than you know. But don't sell out. Don't sell out. And don't settle just for a participation trophy, just Sunday morning. Go deeper. Go in. Go in. Don't give up on getting what God has for you. Don't give up on getting your victory. Don't give up on getting your freedom. Don't give up. Don't give in. You're praying for your family. Don't you dare give up. You're the lifeline. It's heaven on one side and it's hell on another and you stand in the gap. Saying, I'm not letting go of my family, no. I'm gonna hold on, hold on to Jesus and I'm gonna hold on to my family. I'm gonna win them, I'm not giving up. Church, don't give up. Some of y'all got children, grown children that are in that world. Don't you dare give up. Don't you dare give up. The Lord is listening to your prayer. He's listening, and I can almost guarantee he's listening, saying, yeah, come on, keep going. That victory is there. Come on, don't you give up. Don't you throw in the towel. You need victory for your marriage. You need victory for, don't you dare give up. Don't you dare throw in that towel, say, man, it's, I'm come, Lord, I'm going to take you at your word. Everyone bow your head and close your eyes please. And if you're in this room and say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, I'm going to tell you, he's ready to meet with you. The Lord wants to meet with you. Jesus wants to move in your life. Jesus wants to touch your life. Jesus, he wants to do more in you than you want, than you know. He wants to love you more than you want to love him. He wants to heal you more than you want to be healed. He wants to transform you. He wants to provide for you. He wants to, uh, there are things that only, man, for you. But here's the key. You got to run. You got to get in the game. Jesus. Jesus. Okay, you ready? If you're in this room and you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you're backslidden, if you're far from God, and you say, Pastor, today I want to come close. I want to know him. I want to recommit my life. I just want to know him. I want you to raise your hand. Is there anybody in this room? Is there anyone in this room? Mm. Now, if you're in this room and you say, Pastor, I heard you heard you today. You say, Pastor, I'm tired. Pastor, I'm weary. Pastor, I'm going through it. This fight has been so hard. This fight's been so difficult. But I hear you, and I don't want to give up. I hear you. I don't want to throw in the towel. I hear you. I hear you. Today, 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 I'm going to get the strength about me. I'm going to come close to Jesus. I'm going to get that power that I need. I'm going to get that power that's going to lead to my victory. I'm going to get that encouragement that I need. 
Maybe some of you in this room, I'm tired of praying for my family. I'm tired of praying for that loved one, Pastor. I need a touch. I need the Lord to just come and fill me up again.